This is Stand Up For The Truth, addressing important issues and topics affecting Christians across the nation. Happy Year Reformation Day. <laughs> it is October 31st, 2024. I'm Crash Connell. Fresh new podcast. Mary Danielson is in the studio hosting today. And is this a returning guest today? No. Okay. Brand new guest. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And uh, yes, it is October 31st. Welcome to autumn, I guess, officially, everybody, even though up here in the great north we expected earlier than this. Um, it was 75 in Minneapolis yesterday, and today it is snowing. They're expecting an inch, so yay, well, they can have that. Um, <laughs> I am excited to have as my guest Dr. Danny Faulkner, astronomer at Answers in Genesis. The Bible mentions the heavens around 700 times in 44 of the 66 books. There is no question in the scriptures that the heavens were created by God and all that is in them, that it is good, it is praiseworthy, and it has inspired awe in humans for millennia. So my scripture, in light of all that, Psalm 104, 1-4, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. Oh, pray with me this morning. <laughs> Lord, your glory truly is over all the earth and far beyond what we can perceive or conceive. Thank you that you are all sufficient, that you are even mindful of us every day and every hour. We thank and praise you for your creation, all that you've given us to enjoy and consider in detail, vast and boundless. We lift up those among us in our sphere of influence who don't know you or consider your claims on their lives. We ask for your spirit to do a great work in their hearts and for opportunities also to share our hope with them. Also, we pray for anyone listening who is suffering or grieving, that you would come alongside them to comfort, to be their shield and their strong tower. We pray for Danny and ask for a blessing on his life and his work for the labors that you have given him to do, for ever increasing grace and encouragement, for good health for him and his loved ones. In Jesus' name, amen. Dr. Danny Faulkner holds an MS in physics from Clemson University, an MA and a PhD in astronomy from Indiana University, and he taught at the University of South Carolina Lancaster for over 26 years. He's published over 100 papers in various journals. He works as a researcher, author, and speaker for Answers in Genesis, hosts ARC Encounter trips down to Red River Gorge, that would be in eastern Kentucky, Stargazers Nights at the Johnson Observatory. He hosts astronomy live programs and The Skies Proclaim, his handiwork workshops at the Creation Museum. Some of his books include Universe by Design, Introduction to Astrophysics, The, Great, the Created Cosmos, and Falling Flat, Refuting Flat Earth Claims, and more. Good morning, Danny, and welcome to Stand Up for the Truth. Well, good morning, and thank you for having me on today. Uh, if you would, uh, just take a minute and tell us about your story so our listeners can get to know you just a little bit. Your dad was a pastor. You were raised in a Christian home. Do I have that right? Uh, my uh, my dad and mom uh, felt called to do that, to enter the pastorate. No, my dad entered the pastorate when I was two years old, mm. so they packed us up and moved us a few states away to go to Bible school. And when we moved back close to where I, I'd been born in the first couple, couple years of my life, my dad soon started a church that would have been my first year of school, first grade. Um, my, um, my salvation experience was the following summer uh, between first and second grade at a vacation Bible school. I really mm. understood the, the, my need. In fact, it was a center. The fact that I was, uh, God was not pleased with that. And the only way to, <laughs> to satisfy God's justice and righteousness was uh, through the finished work through his son, Jesus Christ. And so I was born again at a tender age of six, not quite seven. Wow. Um, I kind of drifted through school. I was a PK in a relatively small town, and everybody knew I was a PK. Mm -hmm. But I was a sophomore in high school, you know, almost 10 years later. And um, I can't remember. I saw some Christian kids in the school who were really, you know, seemed to be dedicated to outspoken Christians. And that kind of stung because people didn't think of me as being a Christian. They thought of me as being a preacher's kid, which is different from yeah. being a Christian many times. Yeah. So I rededicated my life then. You know, my sophomore year of high school was a, was a tremendous thing at time in my life for that and a few other things i began to realize that uh, i never given any thought to 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 what i do with my life but i found out that uh, i always loved astronomy since the earliest years 
And I found out you could actually make a living doing astronomy. Yeah. I thought, well, that's really cool. I found yeah. out I had the ability to do that. And I thought that was really neat too. But then I began to realize that that was my calling in life to be an astronomer for God's glory. I, I was confirmed as an, as a, as a six day recent creationist then. And that was my, yeah. my goal in life. So I, I went on that track to, to pursue that. And, um, it's not like I've been working for a living all these years. <laughs> really, really, I really enjoy what I do, yeah. and I, I can't imagine doing anything else. And it's just, I find it very fulfilling to be able to share the wonder of God's creation with people and uh, hopefully introduce them to the plan of salvation by, yeah. by that kind of work. Yeah, and it really does. I think it draws people close to the Lord to, to just behold all that glory. When you look up in the heavens, how can it not just be awe-inspiring? Um how long have you been with AIG? How did how did that uh, come about? Okay, it's been almost, it'll be 12 years at the end of this year. Uh, I was at the University of South Carolina, Lancaster, for over 26 years. Um, I I went there, didn't know how long I would stay. I ended up loving the place. I, I thrived there. I loved the community. I loved the, the, my job, my, my colleagues, my church. It was a just a great situation. But I always had in the back of my mind and my heart to if I ever retired from the university, I wanted to pursue full-time Christian ministry uh, as, a, as a creation scientist. And um, when I was there for five or 10 years, that was a distant thing. After about 15, getting on 20 years, it wasn't a distant thing anymore. And my wife and I talked about it a lot, prayed about it. And um, as we did that, we thought about what might I do? And, and Answers in Genesis kept coming up all hmm. this time. Um, and then I had an opportunity to retire a little bit early. I did it at age 58. Uh, as a, a pretty good situation. And uh, I, I, I could, went down on, on a Friday morning to uh, uh, in December of 2011. My wife and I went down to sign up to officially do this. I could continue working my job up, up for five years, but then I had to actually leave employment uh, full time at the university at that point. I thought I'd spend two or three years uh, looking around, seeing what I might do. Well, five days later, uh, the Wednesday, following Wednesday, I got an email from Jason Lyle, who was my predecessor here as the astronomer at Answers in Genesis, and he told me that he had given us two weeks' notice. I knew he was thinking of leaving, and uh, I just kind of sped it up. And so we began negotiations, and they, they soon offered me the, the job, and we negotiated the time to start that. So the Lord's timing is amazing. I committed mm-hmm. to, to actually leave the university sometime in the next five years, and five days later, I got this opportunity <laughs> to go to what we thought was the place for us anyway. So yeah. it's been a marvelous transition, and uh, I, I, I can't, again, I love being here. I love yeah. the job I had before. I just left one great job for another great job. Yeah. And when I got here, I thought maybe this is my second career, but uh, after I've been here for about a year or so, I began to realize, well, maybe this isn't my second career. Maybe huh. this is my career yeah. that the previous 58 years was just a uh, prologue. Yeah. Uh, not many people start the career that late in life, but I'm way ahead of Moses who started at 80 yeah. and Noah who started at 500. So I'm really ahead of those two. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can totally relate because I did not have a background in radio. And so I started late, later in life as well. But when you see God's hand in it, that just makes everything perfect. It's like just the, the icing on the cake and, uh, even more so to do to do something you love. Not that we didn't love the other things that we did, but but to continue to do what you love is a, a second blessing that is just so fantastic. So what a great story. I, I just love to hear people's stories so that we can get to know you a little bit better. Let's just jump right in here and talk about the heavens. I mean, when I think of the heavens, I think of, because it's day-to-day and we live on this earth, I think of the orderliness of it, you know, the orderliness of orbits, the progression of day and night, keeping track of the passage of time. These are things we take for granted. But then, then there's the complexity of it all. I look up at night, and yes, I do grin from ear to ear still to this day when I look up at what I can see. Um, I grew up with, uh, also, I think this is important, I grew up with the awe inspired by the space race and the moon landing. Um, you know, but beyond all that, there's something so complex and so astounding. And now we have the Hubble telescope, radio astronomy, telescope arrays, And we know more than we ever did. But, Danny, astronomy is a very old science. Um, As mankind has been curious about the heavens uh, since the beginning, it connects us all, to me at least, across the millennia um, without any light pollution. I don't know if I'm going to ask you if you've ever thought this yourself. I'm sure you have. Without any light pollution at all, I wonder what Adam, Abraham, and Moses saw when they looked up. I I, I do ponder these things. Do you ponder these things? Oh, yes. You know, it's really a shame here in the, in the 20th and now the 21st century. Electricity has ruined us in many respects. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, lights inside the house that keep us occupied. We have computers, we have television, other things. Mm-hmm. 
And um, very few people uh, actually have fully experienced um, the night sky. Yeah. I was out at, uh, in Red River Gorge, uh, my dark spot I had to go to, not only hike, but also uh, view things. I was down there two weeks ago looking for the comet, getting a good photograph of the comet and the Milky Way at the same time. Mm. And uh, it was a spot that was really good for seeing the whole sky. Very dark location. And there were some no, no, other people that were trying to do the same thing. Mm. And uh, one couple, uh, they're a little younger than me, but they're not young. And they, uh, they had never seen the Milky Way. Wow. And they wanted to know, could we see it tonight? And said, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I pointed it out to them. I think they had seen it before but didn't know what it was. But so many people have never been in a dark sky. And I've been very privileged with some of the observatories I've been to, some of the places I've traveled, to go to some very dark, high-altitude, dry locations, mm. particularly in the West, where the sky is just fantastic. And, you know, they're in, in, in Israel, uh, and that's a Mediterranean climate. You get in Judean hills, two or 3,000 feet elevation. It's uh, very dry and very clear at night with no moon. Mm. It's astounding what you can see. And I, and I think people back then uh, got that. And I, I like to reflect on the fact that David, you know, years later, wrote Psalm 19 and wrote yeah. uh, Psalm 8. Both would refer to the heavens. Yeah. And uh, I think he was probably inspired by those lonely nights that he was uh, watching over mm -hmm. the sheep uh, mm -hmm. uh, there because he was a shepherd early on in life. So, yeah, people did mm -hmm. spend a lot of time. And I think the patriarchs did and the people in the lineage of, mm -hmm. of Christianity did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there are a couple of dark parks actually in uh, the States. Not too many. There's one in Michigan. Uh, where yep. you can go and there are there is no light to spoil anything. You know, people have bucket lists. Well, that would be my bucket list. And seeing an aurora, I have never seen an aurora. Uh, usually, it's cloudy when this comes up, or again, there's too much light pollution and, and we can't yep. see it. We're far enough north that this last year alone, is there an increase in aurora? Because it seems like people are seeing it farther south than ever, and oh, they're yeah, beautiful. We, uh, it's related to the sunspot cycle, which we're at. We're, we're they pronounce we're now at sunspot maximum. It's eleven year cycle. And uh, so, uh, so solar maximums, lots of sunspots, you get a lot of solar flares. They occur around sunspots. Okay. So the sunspots don't cause aurora, but flares do. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a big outburst, uh, the biggest uh, solar storm in 20 years back in May. And uh, I think people in every state saw, I know people wow. in Florida saw the aurora that night. I saw for about 15 minutes between the clouds here in Kentucky until the sky got completely overcast. But uh, there's another display about a month or so, a month and a half ago, I guess. Um, you'll get these warnings. But the last solar maximum uh, a decade ago, 12 years ago, was pretty wimpy. So there wasn't much activity. But uh, there's probably another year or two we're going to get some. Just okay. watch for the, 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 the forecasts and then try to get out of town if you can. Uh, the one we saw about a month ago was incredible. We had a display. It went on for a half an hour or more. Wow. And I got some photographs of it. It was, it was an amazing thing. Wow. Well, you mentioned the Milky Way and the, and the comet. Um, just this morning, I saw a picture that was taken off the coast of Georgia. And that's somewhere that we go every year where I see most stars. But someone took it, the most stunning picture of that together. And I just saw that this morning. And I, wow, absolutely beautiful. Um, as a scientific study, you know, astronomy uh, is different from other sciences. And I want to ask you how that is, especially observational rather than experiential, but you have math and you have physics, you have chemistry. It's a very complex science. Is it more complex than most? What What is um, your definition of astronomy? Astronomy is just the study of um, everything else in the universe <laughs> outside of the Earth. <laughs> right. You could even include the Earth as a planet, I suppose, but uh, and most of our sciences are, are just focused here on the Earth. You've got uh, geology, the rocks of the Earth, you've got um, chemistry and biology, life on Earth, and the chemistry we see, but uh, astronomy, we have to use a lot of physics. Um, for much of history, astronomy was just more mathematical about uh, computing positions, measuring positions, and so forth. That transformed, it began to transform the end of the 19th century when uh, modern, when we began making developments, what we call modern physics today. And people realized that you could take those physical principles and actually figure out what the stars are made out of, for instance. That was thought to be impossible until spectroscopy was discovered in the middle part of the 19th century. And so they coined a new term called astrophysics. Uh, they, they really thought at the time astronomy and, and this new science of astrophysics would split. So it turns out they did, hmm. and the astronomers all of them went along with it. Sometimes people ask me, what's the difference between astronomy and astrophysics? I, I sometimes tell them I wish that I knew, mm -hmm. uh, because you really can't do astronomy without physics today. And uh, so it is a very, very technical sort of thing. It's, some people think it's just astronomers just gaze at the sky all night. And that's kind of fun to do, but that's not how you learn things scientifically. Uh, and you do 
you do observationally uh, these things. You don't experiment in, in astronomy because you can't control anything that's going on. Okay. So many times we think that that science is all about experimentation, and it's not. It's really about inferences we draw about the natural world and uh, using our five senses. And um, so we can make a lot of inferences about things in astronomy without actually doing any experiments. Hmm. Very interesting. And another phrase that I hear a lot um, is cosmology. Is is that different? I mean, I notice cosmology is used a lot uh, in the more secular expressions of this branch of study. How would you define cosmology? I mean, is, is there is there a difference? Yeah, so cosmology technically comes from the words cosmos and logos, literally meaning world and, and word. Okay. Uh, logos we've generalized to be the study of, but mm-hmm. cosmology is you know, supposed to be the study of the universe. Technically speaking, cosmology is the study of the structure of the universe. Okay. The idea that the Earth orbits the sun, uh, the heliocentric model, that's a cosmology. Uh, but today we generally think of cosmology being the t- entirety of the universe, the, the, the distribution of galaxies and quasars okay. and other objects. Now, closely related to that is cosmogony. That's not a term you hear very often, Mm-mm. but cosmogony is a study of the origin and the history of the universe. And so many times today people say well, the Big Bang cosmology. Technically speaking, the Big Bang model is a cosmogony model. It's a, it's a theory of how the origin came to be naturalistically. It's technically not a cosmology, but I'm fighting a, a losing battle, I'm afraid. I'm making that <laughs> distinction. But I do like to make that distinction that cosmology and cosmogony are very different. Uh, furthermore, I, I like to tell people sometimes the, that, that the cosmology of the Bible is not real clear. It's kind of vague. The cosmogony is clear enough, but the cosmology is not quite uh, specified. Hmm. And I think that's that's a good thing, perhaps. Interesting. You're listening to Stand Up for the Truth for this Thursday. I'm speaking with Danny Faulkner of Answers in Genesis, speaking of the beginnings Genesis, day four. Um, there was already light by then, day one, um, and day and night. And I find myself, uh, you know, curious about the characteristics of each of those days with no sun or moon or stars, not until day four. And then on day four, it says to give light on the earth, to divide the light from the darkness. Uh, so everything was already lit up. And I'm sure you've heard this question many, many times. What was the source of the light on day one? And I know we said at the beginning that God wraps himself in light and my brain, that smashes the pea in my brain, Danny, when I think about that. But the source of that light on day one, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, we don't know what the source is. It's unspecified. Mm-hmm. As I said, the cosmology is not not real, a little clear sometimes. Um, the biggest and most common uh, speculation is it came from the Lord himself, as you mentioned, from Psalm 104. Also, it says in uh, Revelation 21, the the, uh, the new heaven and new earth and in this new Jerusalem will mm-hmm. be there. It says that there will be no need of the light of the sun of the moon because the Lord himself will uh, will be the light. And, and Jesus is that lamp of that light, the lamb, it says, but that's Jesus. Mm-hmm. And um that, that, that kind of fuels the speculation yeah. that, that it was God himself. And I have no problem with that one. I, I, I favor that one. But I want to caution people, don't say definitively that's what the Scripture teaches, because it doesn't. It's just simply a, a kind of an implication we make. Mm-hmm. So um, unspecified, but probably from the Lord himself uh, coming on day one mm-hmm. through day up to day four. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if day one light was not something that we could have observed. I mean, no man observed observed that with their eyes, but maybe it was something that we could not have endured with human eyes, um, especially after, after the fall, you know, especially. Well, what's, what's interesting is, uh, and I missed this for many years myself, a few years ago I noticed it says uh, there in the, in the day one account, it says that God, you know, said, let there be light and there was light and God saw the light was good. And then he, he separated, he divided the yeah. light from the day. I mean, the light from the dark. Yeah. And think about that for just a minute. Um, l- dark is the absence of light. Mm-hmm. That's how we define dark. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so how can you separate light and dark? It's, it's almost as if at the very beginning when God created light, that they were mingled somehow. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, as a guy in physics, I don't quite grasp mm-hmm. what was going on there. I think there was something really peculiar about that first day, at least from our perspective, yeah. that light and dark were mixed somehow because they don't mix today. They're, they're uh, one's, one's present and yeah. the other's absent or vice versa. Yeah. So the light was very different early on from what we experience today. Hmm. That is very interesting. And then um, 
you know, we have the the light bearers, as my husband calls them, the sun and the moon and the stars, that light, they became the light bearers, um, you know, to, to guide us, the lesser light, the greater light. Uh, and it's funny because I, I still go outside and I go, oh, look, there's the lesser light. It's, or it's a full moon or what, you know, it, these things stick with you because that's what God called them. He didn't, he didn't call them the sun and the moon or did he at, at the beginning there? Well, at the, in chapter one of Genesis, he did not. And I think the reason for that is, is because the, the, the names for the sun and the moon are pagan deities. Oh, and, you know, sometimes uh, liberal hmm. scholars try to say, well, the Genesis account of creation is a polemic against the uh, surrounding pagan uh, religions. And, uh, well, that's true, but that's not all that it is. The, 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 okay. the creation account is an incredibly complex uh, document, yeah. and it, it's a polemic against the uh, surrounding pagan nations, but it's far, far more than that. You can have a polemic at the same time be real, re- revealing true history and the factual events. So um, it, it avoids using the name of the sun and the moon by just saying the greater light and the lesser light. Uh, even the, uh, it says there in, in verse 14, one of the purposes to be for uh, seasons and for days and yeah. for years. Days and years are natural units of length of time defined by the astronomical bodies. Uh, the month is too, but it looks like it's missing perhaps. That's defined by the moon, but it says seasons. And the word there, moed, in Hebrew doesn't refer to the climatic seasons of spring, summer, autumn, and fall. Rather, it refers to appointed times for something. We do the same thing today. We talk about baseball season and yeah. deer season. Those are t- periods of time where we, we, we do certain things. And those seasons are being referred to there, are referring to the festivals, primarily uh, the three biggies in the original law given at Sinai, uh, the Passover, Pentecost, and then the Sukkot, the mm-hmm. um, tabernacles mm-hmm. in the fall. And the dates of those were fixed by the the phases of the moon, the the lunisolar calendar they have. So actually, there's a when you see seasons and days and years there, it's actually telling you months. It just avoids using the word for month that we would have today because okay. that would be a pagan word. So it avoids that entirely. But it is there, and and that brings up the fact that astronomy is an old science yeah. uh, because it's uh, one of the fundamental properties, one of the fundamental functions of of astronomy. Is for time reckoning. Yeah, uh, we have the U.S. Naval Observatory, and other nations have those as well, who've been doing time reckoning and navigation and so forth. They were the, they were the describers of time. You know, Stonehenge and other things were uh, monuments around the world were were apparently built as calendars of some purpose. Yeah. we've kind of gotten away from that in modern times. We still do that, but that's a minor part of what astronomers do. But that okay. indicates to me that astronomy is the oldest science, perhaps. Again, mentioned on the day four account yeah. specifically. Very interesting observations. Um, I think about, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curve here, but and it's going to be hard to answer this quickly. But, you know, we have 365 day year and over in Israel, they have 360 day year. They have the 30 day months. Uh, it is a lunar calendar. We have a solar calendar. Um, they have a completely different calendar. When, you know, it's not 2024 um, reckoned by uh, the Hebrew calendar. What? Why is that? And I know, like I said, that's a complicated question, but I'm, I'm interested in this day and age that there is such a difference between our Gregorian, Gregorian calendar and their calendar. Yeah. The um, original calendars, we think, were probably lunar. The uh, lunar month, the synodic okay. month, the phases of the moon, those are uh, actually a 29 and a half day. And usually in a, in a lunar calendar, you have alternating months of 29 and 30 days, back and forth, back and forth. That only totals up to 355 days or so, about 10 days short of a full year. And uh, if you don't make an adjustment for that, then your calendar gets out of sync. The Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar. That's the reason why the month of Ramadan occurs about 10 days earlier every year. It's about a 35-year cycle where it goes through all of these. But the calendar the uh, ancient Hebrews used apparently was was a lunisol solar calendar. And what they would do is about every third year, they would insert a uh, 13th month to get things back in sync. If you go mm-hmm. through one year and you're off by 10 days, the next year you're up by 20 days, and next, the next mm-hmm. year it accumulates to 30 days, you put a, a third month, a 13th month in to catch up okay. with all of that. And usually that was done in the spring, uh, beginning of the year. The uh, the vernal equ- spring equinox is in Mar- March, equinox is in is in. Uh, in March there, and that's usually when they would start the start the year. And so that intercalary month, that, that catch-up month, was usually inserted at the end of the year. 
in the some of the months on the on our calendar September October November December that's they've got the roots seven eight nine and ten that's because they were they were months seven eight nine and ten on their calendar okay. we've shipped it back to January back when they did the Gregorian reform for four and a half centuries ago wow. the um, the Romans were the ones that introduced to us the uh, thirty and thirty one day months for the most part. And that was a long story there. I don't need to get into that, but it has certain advantages. It's a solar calendar then as opposed to a lunisolar calendar. And they, um, so we we started doing that in 45 BC, I think, was when Julius Caesar instituted that. And then there was a reform 450 years ago for the Gregorian calendar, which is a slight modification on it. So we've gotten away through the Romans. We've gotten away from a, a lunisolar calendar. And that's why the, the Hebrews have a, have a different calendar from us. Okay. And that's why um, Passover jumps around on our yeah. calendar. If you look on our calendar, yeah. it's it's a different different day, different month, sometimes between March and April. However, on a lunar solar calendar, it's always on the uh, 15th day of the month, which is a full moon. And where that occurs is determined by when you put that inner calorie month in uh, before the month of Abib, which co- corresponds roughly to, to March uh, each year. Okay. Okay. Very, very interesting. I had I had to just throw that in there. Also, uh, and we have a break in a couple of minutes, but day and night. Um, now, that requires a round rotating Earth. Thanks to social media, the whole flat Earth thing vexes a lot of us frequently because, um, I mean, throughout history, people believed in a round planet. I, I believe that. Um, and is it true that people ever believed in a, a flat Earth uh, or is that just to take shots at the creation account? What What's the history of this whole flat Earth thing? Well, the early cosmology is a little tricky to, to sort out, but uh, apparently we think the Greeks probably believed in a, in a flat Earth hmm. uh, until about 2,500 years ago. Um, Pythagoras in the 6th century said the Earth is spherical, as did um, Parmenides in the next century. Aristotle wrote a book uh, in 350 B.C. That's 2,400 years ago called On the Heavens. I've read portions of it. And very early on, he says the earth is a sphere. And he gave four reasons why. So at least in the West, uh, people have known for 2,500 years the earth is spherical. It's what I call the Columbus myth that was created in the 19th century to uh, discredit the church. <laughs> they yeah. tried to tell us that the, that the earth was was uh, spherical and people said it was flat because the Bible said so. The Bible never said that. And the church never taught that. It's amazing why. Mm. Mm. as an evolutionary connection to it. And much of our understanding, unfortunately, comes from the Columbus myth. So, um, yeah, people in the West have known the Earth is spherical for a long time. The flat Earth movement just blew up in the last decade or so, again, through antisocial, I mean, social media and YouTube <laughs> videos and things like that. Antisocial media. Yeah, I'm, I'm stealing that one. Just so you know. Go ahead. I, I stole it from somebody else. <laughs> Well, and it makes you wonder exactly why people would insist on that. People that uh, it seems like the look on their face is, well, we know better, but we're just we're just trying to tweak you a little bit. So I don't know. I don't know. But I've, I've run into people like that and you can't really tell them anything. So I've, I've distanced myself from that. This is Mary Danielson. You're listening to Stand Up for the Truth with Dr. Danny Faulkner of Answers in Genesis. And one thing that I wish to ask him when we come back, I want to talk about the light time, the light travel time problem. Um, you know, the age of the earth uh, biblically, you know, the lights we see in the sky, uh, they're said to be seen um, at distances far greater than the 6,000 years. Um, you know, light travels, uh, how, how far does light travel in a year? I mean, if I'm driving to Florida, I'd measure my distance and the time it gets there in miles. I understand what I need to know to get there and back. You know, Florida is not visible to the naked eye from Wisconsin, but I know it's there and I'll get there in a couple of days. But in the universe, it is not that simple. Um, We're talking billions of light years beyond Earth, uh, galaxies that are, um, you know, light years across, billions of light years across. And then there's the time dimension. So we want to I want to ask Danny Faulkner about this when we come back. So we are going to take a two minute break and we come back. We will have all the answers to all of this. So stay tuned to Stand Up for the Truth. Thank you so much for sharing today's Stand Up For The Truth video podcast. We invite you to check out our other headline news site, ctrnn.org. That's ctrnn.org. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. 
Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for October 31st. We are speaking to Dr. Danny Faulkner with Answers in Genesis. And I want to talk to him, talk to him about the light travel time problem. And he has an article that you can look at if you're interested in this. It's at, it's at the AnswersResearchJournal.org. And it's called A Proposal for a New Solution to the Light Travel Time Problem. And I'm going to introduce this briefly. And then I want to ask you about your thoughts on this because there are there are several theories. But you've been thinking about this for a long, long time. And you say in this article in the introduction, the light travel time problem is one of the greatest challenges that recent creationists face today. Simply defined, if the universe is only thousands of years old, as the Bible strongly suggests, how can we see objects that are at light travel time distances far greater than a few thousand years? A a popular unit of distance used in astronomy is the light year, the distance that light travels in a year. And then you, you go into the specifics Uh, and the physics of all of that. But what did Adam see at the beginning of his life on Earth, and why is that a dilemma? Because the stars are for the passages of times and seasons. We understand that from Genesis. So um, if you would would please just dive into this, because um, my, my simplistic mind says, well, let's just put it in miles, and let's not call it a light year, end of issue, but I do not have the physics master's degree as you do. So help us out here. Well, uh, we need to keep in mind that that the light year is not a unit of time. It's a unit of distance. Okay. That's, that's an important distinction to make. Yes. Okay. And you ask about miles, and indeed it's a good question, except the closest star to us is around 26 trillion miles away. Ah. Uh, that's a mind. That's a mind-boggling number. Uh, I used to tell people that's even bigger than a national debt, but it isn't anymore, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, both are mind-boggling numbers, and that's just the nearest star. So I think using miles is not really practical. So okay. we we define other units in astronomy. The, technically, we use a unit called the parsec, but the light year is what we like to share with the public. I think they relate to that a lot better. Yeah. So if you take the uh, speed of light, multiply by the number of seconds in a year, you get about six trillion miles, which is still a staggering number, but manageable when you say the nearest star is like four and a third light years away and the, this galaxy is that far away and so forth. We do see galaxies that are millions or even billions of light years away. For instance, when I look at the um, Andromeda galaxy, I can see it in evenings now if I got a dark location, see it with my naked eye. And it's uh, it's about two million light years away from us. So the, the obvious question is, well, you creationists, you think that the world is only thousands of years old? And indeed we do. So how can we can we see that? And that's a, that's a big problem. I, I'm not afraid to admit that's a big problem, mm-hmm. and it requires a big answer. And I, I've stood over this question for over 50 years. About 20 years ago, I came to uh, to peace about the whole thing. And one of the key points I like to talk about is instead of worrying about us today seeing the most distant things in the universe, let's consider Adam's light travel time problem, because yeah, he had one. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, we asked the question. I love the fact that you asked that question. What did Adam see? What did Eve see the very first night they looked up? And I think the answer is they saw pretty much what we see today. They uh, the, the distance, the light t- travel time to the moon is only a second, uh, one and a third seconds to the planets, a matter of a couple hours at the most. So obviously seeing things in the solar system wasn't a problem, but the nearest star was is more than four light years away. So how did Adam and Eve see those? And you may ask, well, how do I know Adam and Eve saw those things? Well, on the end of day four, God pronounced that it was good. And at the end of day six, over the whole creation week, he said it was very good. And that goodness of creation refers to the completeness of it, the fact that things were functioning the way that God intended them and planned and designed them to do. So if they were not fulfilling their functions, they would not be good in God's sight. Yeah. And we are given several several things there, several purposes of the stars given to us in the day four account in chapter one of Genesis. And that necessitated that all of those stars be visible. That's my basis for understanding that Adam actually saw these things. I think he probably saw the Andromeda galaxy too Hmm. at that point. So if we can solve Adam's problem with light travel, I think we can solve our own as well. And what got me going this direction 20 years ago was I began thinking about the other days of creation. I think that God's consistent in the way he does things. And there's probably some patterns we might pick up from one day we might suspect was operating another day. And many times in, when we talk about creation, we tend to think of everything being instantaneous and during the creation week and everything being made out of nothing, mm-hmm. the Latin word being ex nihilo. 
And certainly some things were created instantly in ex nihilo, but certain things were not. For instance, man was made from the dust of the ground, and woman was made from his side. That's not instantaneous. It was a process. God did surgery on man to make, make Eve. That took a little time, and he took existing material and transformed it. And we also, if you, and I missed this many times myself, but in the second chapter of Genesis, it says that the um, birds and the land animals came from the ground as well, yeah. similar how Adam did. Mm -hmm. And um, so I see a pattern there. And on day three, the uh, plants just didn't suddenly appear. I used to think that poof, you know, oak tree appeared where there wasn't one. <laughs> if you look very carefully, the terminology there, I think in verses 11 and 12, indicates that uh, these these plants begin to sprout and shoot and grow up out of the ground. It'd be yes. like, if you would have been there, like a time-lapse movie. Uh, Eric Hoven, about a few years ago, did a movie called Genesis Paradise Lost. We used to show part of that movie uh, in the FX Theater here at the Creation Museum. And he, uh, I think Eric did a masterful job of showing that because day three of creation, all these plants are sprouting out of the ground. You hear this creaking and popping <laughs> as branches come out, leaves and fruit. I think exactly how it happened. It was a very fast process. He rapidly matured those plants. What purpose was that? Well, in a few days, you'd have animals and man who were going to require eating those things for their food, according to, um, I think, verse uh, uh, 30 of, of chapter 1 of Genesis. So in order for those to be good, they had to be able to fulfill their functions right away. So I think in a similar manner, on day four, God only, not only quickly uh, made the heavenly bodies, but he rapidly brought the light to the earth, not by a physical mechanism. Some some of my creation science brethren want to explain it with relativistic effects using current science. But to me, that's that strikes me as being, um, being uniformitarianism. You're trying to apply the present processes to the past. I'd have mm -hmm. to ask you, uh, how much uh, how much about the creation week was natural it, none of it was it was supernatural it was rapid it was it was magical not magical but it was creation from god himself mm -hmm. and so uh, why would we then settle for a naturalistic explanation for bringing the light here i think that's part of the miracle of creation god brought that light here not that he created the life as if it were coming but really wasn't coming it uh, he made that light come here very quickly then had the transition somehow to uh, stasis that we see today or the slower process we see today. How that transition happens, what evidence we might see of it is a mystery to me. I don't mm -hmm. understand it well enough to say. But when I, I use the example of the Andromeda galaxy, I do believe it's two million light years away. But I don't think the light has been traveling nearly that long when I look at it. Okay. Wow. Wow. My... <laughs> This is mind expanding stuff. It really, really is because there have been other theories, you know, that um, light traveled faster than or, or a light year is, was different uh, in length. Then uh, time dimension changes things, gravity changes things. Uh, there are so many. My head was swimming uh, this week as I was looking into the various things that people uh, have thought. But as, as I think about um, uh, some of the verses in the scriptures and what we opened up with, you know, the stretching of the heavens. Um, is that uh, related to getting starlight to the earth on day four? Is it, I mean, I don't know if our, our minds, if, is this above our pay grade, is what I, I guess I'm asking if our minds can understand this. But how do you understand the stretching of the heavens as much as we can possibly understand that? I know, uh, 30 years ago, my friend Russ Humphreys uh, wrote a book, Starlight and Time, where he invoked yeah. um, that, those verses dealing yeah. with the stretching of the heavens coming from the poetic and prophetic books of the Old Testament. I think there are 11 clear statements of that and a couple others kind of not so clearly, but still there. And he was wanting to talk about that, stretching the light uh, to get here. I um, I don't really like that interpretation. Okay. And uh, furthermore, I, for many, many years, uh, I, I believe that the stretching of the heavens may refer to the expansion of the universe. That was mm. something discovered by Evan Hubble in uh, 1929. He uh, Technically, he didn't discover the expansion of the universe. He discovered what we call the Hubble relation, that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it seems to be moving away from us. And the interpretation is that it's expansion. But it's, um, uh, it is an interpretation. I think it's the best interpretation, but I'm open to, to other interpretations of that fact we observe of the redshifts and distances being correlated. But um, you know what? what really strikes me is the fact that a few years ago, probably 10 or 12 years ago, it occurred to me that 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 the expansion of the universe is not a good fit for day four at all. Okay. On day two, God made this expanse. That's in the King James and older uh, translations. It's rendered as firmament, which is not a very good translation at all. Expanse is actually the better translation. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
but God expanded the uh, something there in the midst of the waters on on day two, and and uh, later on on day four, four account. By the way, He called this thing heaven. Yeah. And on the day four account, three times it says that He placed the luminaries, the sun, moon, and stars, in the expanse of heaven. The, I think three times there for for emphasis to let us know, lest there's any doubt that he's placing the heavenly bodies in the thing he made on mm-hmm. day two. Okay. So I think that the day two refers to the creation of the, of the heavens that we see around us, the great distances involved. So that expansion, if you will, to get the universe and then build on day four, it already happened, didn't happen on day four. Mm. Interesting. That, the whole thing about bringing forth, you know, let uh, let this let these things sprout. Uh, coming back to that, just for a little bit, it's it seems as though everything um, was made, uh, was created out of nothing, and it was a continual. The creation was a continual process over through day six. It seems like everything was in place, and then bringing forth. Uh, I don't know if you actually said that already, but it seems like it's a continuation. That each day is not necessarily a new creation. Do you get what I'm saying there? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's continuity. I mean, God did certain things on certain days, made the dry land and the plants on day three, made man on day six. But I think he used a consistent pattern of doing these things okay. throughout the creation week. I don't think he did things very differently on one day and very differently on another day. I think there's a continuity there because God is a consistent God. And that is what makes science possible. The uh, the, the universe is a knowable place because it's being sustained by the power of his, of his word. Mm-hmm. That's uh, Hebrews 1, 3, as well as... Uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. And and uh, moment by moment, God is sustaining the world, and he's doing that in a consistent manner because he's a consistent God. He's one of uh, the God, a God of order and by decrees. Yeah. And so we mistake this as just physical laws that happen to be on the universe. No, why is the universe so knowable? I think it's because God's knowable, and he's imprinted, if you will, uh, that sort of characteristics onto the universe so it makes science possible. Without that, so we couldn't do science. Okay. Oh, Yeah. Uh, it also talks about uh, the water above the firmament or expanse. I like that uh, expanse instead of firmament. Water above it, he separated the water above it and the water below it. The water above it, are we talking about weather and clouds, that sort of thing? Is that what that refers to? Well, that's the opinion of some people. Some people think uh, uh, I could name some names of people who I trust and I like and, and, and really support quite a bit who think it's referring to atmospheric water, clouds and rain and so forth, or hydrologic cycle. Mm-hmm. I respectfully disagree. Mm. I, I think it's... Um, it's talking about waters that are above this expanse that he made. He divided mm. it, and in this thing, the water. I think the upper waters were beyond the expanse, and um, if that's correct, then then it it's kind of interesting what I come up with. I come up with this expanse that's come off the universe, off the Earth on day two, which is now the universe as a whole. It would suggest that the uh, that the Earth is somewhere near the center of the universe. It doesn't have to be exactly there, but it's somewhere close to the center. And, you know, in modern cosmology, the idea of the universe having a center is anathema. They don't believe there's a center. And even okay. if there were, what's the probability of the Earth being anywhere near that? So they assume that there's no center, and if, if there were, we're nowhere near it. But I think there is a center, and we're near it. It also suggests that there's an edge to the universe where mm. the waters are. Mm. And uh, people ask me, well, what, what kind of physical principle process is going on there? Well, I don't know. It's the edge yeah. of the universe. I can't comprehend that. Yeah. And I think there's water there. And what's interesting to me, I can d- derive this, and I've written about this in the Answers Research Journal and on our website at answersingenesis.org. But um, I'll just give you the short of it. The, the, the waters there, I think, are, are liquid water. It's normal water. And uh, any kind of normal matter has to radiate because of a temperature that it has. Uh, and so I would expect from this model there'd be a, a radiation field coming from every direction in space. And that was what Penzias and Wilson discovered in 1964, published in 1965, which was supposed to be the evidence for the Big Bang. Uh, it's supposed to be a relic of the of the Big Bang a few hundred thousand years after the, the universe started. But I, I beg to differ. I think we're actually looking at radiation coming from the waters above on uh, the day two of creation week. Mm. I'm glad I asked. That is very fascinating. So, so the universe does not continue to expand. Uh, it's not a bound, boundless as we would think of uh, boundless in this case? Well, I, I can, I think there's an edge. You know, it's not boundless. I think there's an edge to it. Okay. Of what's beyond the edge, I can't say, because yeah. it's not this part of the universe. I have no problem with the universe continuing to expand. It just means that the boundary out there is continuing to expand as well with it. Okay. But uh, I'm again, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm open to other interpretations yeah. of the Hubble relation. If somebody yeah. can come up with one that's plausible, I would certainly look into it. Yeah. 
And, and when I think about an ever-expanding universe, I think, well, the galaxies and the stars are still where we can see them. They are not moving outward. You know, when I look up and I see Orion and the Big Dipper and, and that sort of thing, it's, it's, they are still where they've always been. So they wouldn't be expanding along with the edge of the universe. Well, the, the, the ones in our galaxy would not be, but other galaxies okay. would be beyond Andromeda. Andromeda is bound gravitationally to the, the Milky Way. But uh, other galaxies out there, I'll okay. say 50, 60 million light years or more, they're actually are, seem to, they do seem to be getting away from us. Uh, the thing is, over the vast distances, over many human lifetimes, it's not going to make a big difference <laughs> sure. how much right. away they are. <laughs> right. If somebody in San Diego uh, moves 10 feet away from you, you're not going to notice no. uh, here in the Midwest. But yeah. if somebody in the office with you moves 10 feet away, you're going to notice that. It's all perspective on sure. how far, what kind of distances you're talking about. Wow. I'm glad I asked, actually. And I have another question about um, uh, the gospel and the stars. You know, people, people, uh, the Maseroth. People talk about, you know, before Jesus, they could look up and see the gospel and the stars. And I'll be honest, I've always had a problem with this because just very objectively, okay, I want to be objective as possible about this. I go outside. I am I am not a believer. I happen to look up in the sky. I see a lot of stars and planets. I don't necessarily connect them uh, in a, a pictorial form. Um, do I look up and see that I am a lost sinner and I fall short of the glory of God and that there is a Savior? And, and all the things that we, that we talk about are included in the gospel. I don't see that, and yet books have been written and people believe that. What, do you know what, what is the origin of that, and what are your thoughts on the gospel and the stars? I first heard about the gospel and the stars uh, 45 years ago, and uh, I, I immediately I realized it was a problem here. And I've, I've studied it off and on quite extensively. I've got a bunch of books on my bo- a bookshelf behind me here in the office uh, written by this. The first book on it was written by Frances Rolleston around 1863, I believe, or 65. She actually had notes, and the book wasn't quite ready, but it was published a year or two after her death. And then uh, two clergymen, uh, one was... Um, uh, Philip Seiss here in Philadelphia in the United States, and the other was E.W. Yeah. Bollinger in the yeah. U.K. And they they read her stuff, and they liked it, and they repackaged it. Oh. I think I think Seiss's book is easier to read. Bollinger is probably closer to how uh, Ralston wrote. I've written read all three of those books numerous times, reading through it. And then there, those are secondary sources. And then the tertiary and quaternary sources are books written much later, and, and new books come out all the time on this. Mm. It's kind of a nice, quaint thing that people like to, to believe. I think there's a, yeah. a bit of a Gnostic appeal involved yeah, in all of this. Yeah, definitely. But, but I've investigated. Her thesis was that they were, they were the names, you know, the originally was a soteriolo- soteriological message in the constellations and star names, and uh, that somehow it was perverted into astrology and pagan beliefs. But when I check her her uh, entomolo- etymologies of, of of names, it's 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 really pretty bad. There are a couple of names, uh, Svalikan and Rotenev, a couple of stars in the constellation Delphinus that she found meanings in Syriac and one other language. I think the problem is uh, those two names were coined in her lifetime. Somebody added them to star charts while she was a young woman. Hmm. Uh, so. That hmm. was not ancient at all. <laughs> uh, there are many, many other problems. I just want to cut to the chase. Mm-hmm. The one thing they, they, they like to do is is uh, they say that Orion is a type of Christ. Mm-hmm. And and uh, Orion is one of my two favorite constellations. I really like Orion. Yeah. And uh, Orion is mentioned uh, three times in Scripture, twice in, in Job and once in um, oh, one of the minor prophets. I just suddenly drew a blank. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, the... Uh, the problem is, if you if you look up the word used for uh, Orion those three times, it uh, the word is kasil, and it's one of the two Hebrew words translated fool in the Old Testament. It's not the impious one. It's simply the person who acts imprudently. Well, I'm sorry, but Jesus Christ is not a fool. Yeah, wow. And this is the name, this is the word that, the Holy Spirit used to mm-hmm. to relay mm. the name Orion to us, and they they avoid that. They, they go to the the pagan name Orion and try to find some sort of soteriological meaning in Akkadian and all this kind of other languages. Right. But the real name the Bible chooses to use is is a fool, and to me that's that's blasphemous. It's, it's offensive yeah. to me yeah. that somebody would equate the two. And if, and if you really look into it, those are the kind of problems you have. Yeah. So okay. uh, it's Amos, by the way, is the other the minor Amos. prophet that, okay. that meant to mention yeah. mention Orion. And yeah. I knew what it come to. I just drew a blank for a moment. So yeah. anyway, so I've been a, I've been a critique a critic of of the uh, Gospel of the Stars for quite a long time. But people just will not let go of yeah. it. They they find such comfort 
And there are many other things that people like the Bible code and things like yeah. this that, mm-hmm. that they, they, they simply like, but it's not, nothing there. Yeah, I think Gnosticism is a good word for it. Um, you know, as, as we wind down here a bit, I, it went so fast. Um, astronomical aspects of the crucifixion, the second coming, apocalyptic signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, creation, groans. It's a fascinating verse to me as well. Um, and, and all the different aspects of creation that are continue on, even though, like you said, we have antisocial media, we have all these things to distract us, but nothing has changed there. And, and in the times that we're living in, Danny, we have people who talk about blood moons and they attach dates to that sort of thing. Uh, I did a lot of research into what a gentleman named Mark Biltz was, was studying, and I, I wasn't buying what he was selling. Because when you walk it backwards, he talked about, well, there was a blood moon uh, when Israel became a nation. No, it was several years later. And so I found tons of flaws in there. Really disappointed about that. And yet, like as you say in one of your books, this blood moon thing sets the bar very low for prophecy fulfillment. It's not going to stop. And also last April, the rapture was supposed to happen when we had the great American eclipse. And I couldn't roll my eyes farther in the back of my head, Danny, at that time. How can people deal with this round of apocalyptic speculation, which is going to continue on? What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, it's another form of Gnosticism. Yeah. People um, really get excited about it. I went, and when I was 15, almost 16 years old, I went to uh, Jack Van Impey's first uh, citywide crusade in oh. Dayton, Ohio. It was the summer of 1970. Wow. And, and he had me. He really did. He laid out this apocalyptic thing where it looked like the Lord had to return sometime in the mid-70s. Mm-hmm. Of course, it didn't happen. And then there was a parade of planets, the uh, Jupiter effect in yeah. 1982. And then there was a 40th anniversary of the founding of Israel in 1987. Uh, and then there was the, the uh, uh, let's see, the uh, retaking of Jerusalem, 40th anniversary in, in uh, 2007. I, I sat down a few years ago and totaled up. I've lived through in my adult life 10 ends of the world. Um, <laughs> people... And the and the blood moon business of decade ago was just a, from Mark Belt was just another yeah. one of yeah. those things. Yeah. Uh, there's another one coming up in another four years about an asteroid coming close to the Earth. I've already written an article on it, so I'm just giving you a warning now. It's going to happen again. Don't forget the uh, the sign in the heavens uh, in uh, 2017 with the uh, uh, the for Revelation um, uh, 12 uh, one and two. Uh, that one was a big one too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. People people need to have a memory about these things yeah they need to realize that yeah. if these prophecy gurus tell you all these things lead you to the conclusion that the lord's going to return in the x amount of time and it doesn't happen then the next time around you will be a little more skeptical the next time after that more skeptical right. next time after that more skeptical um i think the thing we can agree on is the lord's going to return yes and we don't know the time even yeah. though mark built thought he could yeah and and Anything beyond that is beyond what Scripture says. We need to be very careful. Yeah. Tread lightly on that, folks. We, yeah. we need to be ready. We need to focus on that. We don't need to be ready because we think the Lord's going to return next week. We need to be ready all the time yeah. because that's the way it's going to happen. Absolutely. And, and I, he has written a book based on this great American eclipse from April that that triggered a round of apocalyptic wars and he's making the rounds, and I really want to encourage the listeners to take a lot, all of it with a grain of salt. There are other issues with Mark, the Hebrew roots movement, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, well, Mark, Mark was, couldn't have been more wrong about the about the about the uh, lunar eclipses a decade yeah. ago, and I suspect he's wrong about this again. I I didn't know about his book. I'll need to check it out. Yeah, it just came out this last spring, so he is. Um, yes, fool me once, shame on me. That sort of thing comes to mind. But I love, I do love what you said in your book. Um, uh, the great the Created Cosmos is the book, and you say that uh, it sets the bar very low for prophecy fulfillment. Yeah, just thinking too small. And like you said, yes, he is coming. So, wow, thank you so much for your time uh, this morning. Did we miss anything specific you want to say? We only have a minute or so left. Oh, there's so much to talk about. Yeah. We, if we want to do some more, we can do it another time if you'd yes, like. Yes, I would love that. I would absolutely love that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner. Answers in Genesis. Um, wow. Uh, we will do it again. I'll be in touch with you about that. What a fascinating, fascinating subject. Um, so we have coming up um, Friday, Robert Meyer is in the studio with me. Uh, he is with Mission America. And now Tuesday is Election Day. I'm going to do some headlines and final thoughts on this plot twist of an election. Always something going on every single day. Will we have a happy surprise or four more years of increasing control uh, versus resistance and uh, daily class and racial warfare? Uh, uh, you know, as we fight for every inch of freedom, you know, to live and speak as our consciences dictate. So tune in for that. 
have some global headlines too, but we're going to do some speculation. <laughs> speculation is really all we can do, but I think we know what's going on. We're going to talk about that. So, um, wow. Thanks for being with me today. Uh, again, tomorrow, Robert Meyer. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were also called in one body and be thankful. Colossians 315. So that's it for today's Stand Up For The Truth. Join me tomorrow and um, have a wonderful day on purpose. Mm-hmm.